It's a program called Networking in between your first and second year. Um, so I actually got placed with Networking at RBC. Uh, 19 years later, I'm, I haven't left. So that's where I got my start from. So yes, I am an alumnate, I believe they call us. Alumna. Alumna. Alum. 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 Yes, but Alum I think back in the day. Alumnate. Alumnate. Oh, I like okay. Alumnate. <laughs> <laughs> that's even better. I got the word in there. I'm a little slow, but you know. <laughs> yeah, and then they didn't have a degree program back then, so then I had to go on to the University of Lethbridge and I got my degree uh, in management there. So, yeah. Wow. Um, thank you guys for coming. I um, uh, appreciate your attendance and your feedback after the session. If you're not in our Google course, I've got it up on the um, whiteboard. Anybody who's a Nate staff or student can join that, and then you'll see what we've got going on, um, as well as our handles for social media. But I'm going to leave it to you, experts, and they will be staying behind after if you have one-on-one -on -one questions you want to ask. So uh, my name is Carrie Andrews, and I'm the business account manager with RBC Royal Bank. Uh, and I am out of the Inglewood Square of St. Albert Branch. My name is Eric. Uh, I'm with the Rock Bank as well, business account manager. I'm located at the McGrath Heights area. Uh, so I actually <coughs> graduated two years late, later than you, uh, you have a accounting background. Um, after that, I uh, built three different tech companies, and with my last one, we had an exit. And after that, uh, I came to the Roy Bank and uh, mainly focused on business right now. So uh, glad to be here today, and uh, thank you so much for for your time by coming to our session. Yeah. And uh, we want to, you know, take your journey how to create a new uh, create a business plan. So hopefully, you know, we're going to share some news or share some information that's going to be valuable to you. Uh, it's good that we have a room of, uh, of lesser people, so we can make it more interactive, make it more fun. And with that, I'll uh, pass on to you to get started. Yeah, we'll also introduce, we have three more, because oh. you know, the more bankers you get right. in the room, the better. Um, <laughs> so we have, uh, Kyle, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure, uh, my name is Kyle Townend. I also work on the south side of the 91st Street and 51st Avenue branch in small business, as do uh, Carrie and Eric. Uh, my name is Catlin Dowerful, and I'm also a business account manager in the south side. Uh, I work in the same office as he does. Hi, I'm Deborah Sorney. And I'm a senior commercial account manager, and I lead up the tech team for Edmonton and Northern Melbourne. Awesome. So today we're going to talk to you about creating a business plan. So uh, business plans are really important when you're looking to uh, start your own business, when you're looking to change the direction your current business is going, um, or if you're just, you know, don't have anything to do on a Saturday night, create a business plan, do it. Um, just kidding. Um, so the business plan really is your uh, blueprint for success, exactly like it says here. So um, I like to um, spot off a lot of corny, um, cheesy lines. So uh, businesses don't uh, plan to fail, they fail to plan. <coughs> right? So this is why the business plan is actually so important for um, any business. So it puts the business owner in control. It identifies the risks that are out there, it identifies the key players, outlines your long-term objectives, highlights your strengths and weaknesses. So I've been doing this for about 13 years. I could write you guys the absolute awesomest business plan in the world. But if I don't have key players, if I don't have those things in my actual business, my business won't actually succeed, right? Um, and here are some of the importance of the business plan. So basically, when you are creating the this, this business plan, it's going to describe your business. So in a nutshell, when somebody look at it, it's going to tell me exactly you know which industry your business is in and what you do with, with the business, whether that's providing a service or you're building a product. Uh, and you are going to evaluate progress against your business goals. So basically, the business plan you can view as a living canvas, right? It's, it's always changing. And, and within the business plan, later we're going to talk about you know, who are your target, you know, who are your target market, who are your competitors, what are your unique value propositions, right? So, and, and that is, is going to help us to set up a goal for, for your business success. Um, <coughs> evaluate new business opportunities. So when, when you are building a business plan, you are going to think about your business, what are some of the opportunities out there and how you can take advantage and leverage all of the opportunities. As far as support, support financing requests, 
Uh, this one is really important when you present your business plan, whether to an investor or to a lender. Uh, now, of course, you know, when we are presenting this to an investor, uh, the metrics or the key financials that are going to look at it's going gonna, it's gonna to be different when you are coming to, to the bank because you know basically if we look at it, your business is gener generating enough cash flow to service that versus the investor they're looking at return on their on their money. So on the tables we have some sample business plans. Um, we also have uh, like a template out there somewhere that is just kind of like a plug and play that's on our um, actual website that you can go to. But the business plan itself, again, we, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, you know, it's a living document. Everything in it is really important. Um, when you're giving that giant package to a bank, um, that package is about 10% for me as a lender and about 90% for you as the business owner. Okay? So, Super important. I think a lot of people just think that, oh, I just got to do the business plan because the bank tells me to. No, you're going to do the business plan because your business is going to be better because of it. Okay, so in a typical business plan, you're going to have seven <coughs> sections. We will go through each and every section and kind of why they're important and, and what you can do um, to go through them. So if we go to the introduction. So this is going to be um, your first impression. So you'll see some of them are really colorful and flashy, and they don't have to be. I've had business plans that have been drawn out on napkins. But give me an introduction. Tell me who you are, right? And then the biggest piece is going to be that executive summary. The executive summary is going to be my quick little two-minute read, and it's going to tell me what I'm going to read later on and to get into more depth, right? But you need to tell us, you know, what is your industry sector? What is the target market? How are you going to differentiate yourself from the competitors? Are you a sole proprietorship or are you incorporated? Is it a partnership? Those things matter. They really do. Is your business already in operation or is it a brand new startup? I, don't, I think people don't realize that if your business has been around for 18 months, you're still a startup. At RBC, we consider a startup anything less than 24 months. Right? What are your team's experiences and credentials? And what is your projected financial performance? So taking all of those sections that is gonna come behind, you'll see them all up at the top, and putting them in one concise little executive summary is perfect. I think you guys have to do that in class all the time, right? For all your essays and even your resume. And when it comes to team, so this is, you know, some business plans think about this, as you know, very early in the so right after the exit summary, some business plans they put it after, but you know it really doesn't matter. But what the what the team should include is who are the core people in the business, and we want to know as a lender, we want to know what are some of the experiences that you know uh, the each individual have, or what are some of the capabilities, or even their education that each individual on your core management team have with the business, because that helps the lender to assess you know, whether the management team can operate this, this business at a capacity <coughs> to you know, take them uh, to success. Uh, if you have any board advisors, if you know, the business is early, this might not be applicable to you. But if you do, so this is something that you want to put on your business plan because it's further going to give more confidence to whoever you're presenting it to, whether that's a investor or a lender. Uh, if, if you have any professional services, lawyers, accountants, as well as banker, uh, that is important as well because we know that you have the relationship around you that can help to to build your, your business and to have that ro robust kind of uh, relationship uh, to help you to achieve, achieve success. As well as any human resources, you know, for example, how are you gonna you know hire or what are your hiring pipelines, right? So so that is also important to the bank because we want to evaluate uh, not only the core team of your business, but rather as you know what are some of the other components within that team as well. I'm just gonna add a little bit to this. So remember that amazing business plan that I'm gonna write for you guys. Um, so it's a mechanic shop, just so you know, by the way. So I'm gonna open up a mechanic shop. So where this team and why it's really important comes into play is when I present this to the bank, the banker looks and goes, but you're a banker, what do you know about a mechanic shop? So if I tell you all about my business experience and my business background and everything, it still doesn't help me service cars. 
but when I write in there that my management team consists of my husband, who's been a journeyman mechanic for 20 years. It changes the picture a lot, doesn't it? It takes that business plan and tells me, who am I and how am I gonna get this done? Okay, I have a, an experienced mechanic that makes that business plan more rational and more reasonable, right? So really, this is one of my favorite parts of it, of a business plan, is who are they and why are you going to get into this business, right? What experience do you have in this industry? Or are you just, hopping on the cannabis train because everybody's opening up a cannabis store, right? Um, so all of these things, this is really important. And then I'm also gonna stress again that you need to have an amazing accountant, you need to have a really great lawyer, and you need to have a banker who knows your business. Those are the three pieces that if you don't have that in your business, you probably will not succeed. They are very important to any small business or large business. Large businesses put these out as departments, right? You might have your own law department. You might have. And when you're looking at your lawyer and your accountant, ask them, are they familiar with businesses in your field? Are they familiar with businesses at your stage? So that each one of these professionals, the lawyer, the accountant, the banker, all know your business, understand your business, because that will make a difference. Yeah. Just because your lawyer is your cousin who does primarily real estate doesn't she mean that and she's going to make a great business lawyer. And, and with, with uh, lawyers and accountants, you get what you pay for. If people come in and say, do you have the card of a cheap accountant? No, we do not. You don't want them. Yeah. Makes sense. Business environment, this one's pretty simple and self-explanatory. This is all you. This is what does your business have to do when it leaves the office, right? So you need to know what's the history, what's the environment, what are the industry trends, the growth prospects. So in that industry that you're about to venture into, how are you going to create that distortion, that noise? How are you going to create that focus on you. Because if you're in a nail salon, in a strip of 30 nail salons, what makes you different? Okay, you need to know, part of this business environment, you need to know is the economy right now, oh hi. Um, right now, one of the trends that we're seeing is healthy eating actually going by the wayside. Right? These are not industries that are doing well. Why? Because people are sad about the economy, so they tend to gear more towards, say, alcohol, all of those bad things for you, right? So you need to know where you are in those historic trends. If you all of a sudden decide to open up a gourmet meta shop, is it the right thing to do in this industry and in the trends? Yeah. yeah, and also, you know, I think timing of entry is really important. It really depends on what you do, you know, the type of service or product you're providing. Um, just for, for example, um, who here knows about how Airbnb first moved when they first got started? No. So, so they actually started in 2007. Uh, it's co-founded by uh, Brian and Joe uh, in San Francisco in, in their little dorm. Uh, their, their name initially was called Air Mattress and Breakfast. Uh, and the, and the how, how they started that company was because, you know, during uh, the school seasons, all the dorms get filled up. And, you know, there are new students that, that come, come to school or visiting, they have no place to stay. And they want to look for something that's cheap, convenient. So they actually bought a whole bunch, I think it was 1,000 air mattresses, and they put them in, in their dorms. Right. And, and, uh, and, yeah. and, uh, and the additional services, they were provi providing breakfast to them. So that's how they got started. But you know, that wasn't scalable, right? And they, they, they found that the market isn't there because they're just too small, right? And going forward to 2008, that's when you know, uh, a lot of festivals, a lot of events, uh, you know, a lot of these things are happening in the States. And then when, when these festivals are happening, all the hotels get fully booked. So people from all over the globe travel to the States to attend a festival, they have nowhere to stay. So they actually reinvented themselves, and that's when the timing, uh, the entry into the market is really important. So they were the first, per, the first business uh, entrance into the business, 
and they quickly scaled, and they actually turned those air mattresses into beds, and then they actually outsourced them to individual uh, homeowners uh, to provide the additional space. So if the hotels were not fully booked, their business probably wouldn't be successful. So entry into the uh, timing of entry into the market is really important for a business, whether you're, you're building a product or providing a service. And that leads directly into your marketing plan. Right, so what's happening out there and how are you gonna make that distortion? How are you gonna make that noise? How are you gonna brand your business going forward? Franchises will help you with this marketing plan if that's what you're looking to do. But if you are a sole, like you're just, I got my idea, this is all you, okay? Um, so yeah, how, who are you going to market your product to? All of these things. So this is when you're gonna use um, Stats Canada. This is when you're gonna go, there's other, um, we use ex almost exclusively uh, vertical IQ uh, at RBC. I know you guys could use it too, but I think you have to pay for the service. But what that does is it shows you target markets. It shows you, um, you know, I'm looking to, uh, you know, target my uh, mechanic shop specifically to um, 18 year olds, you know, 18 to 25, you know, in this specific area. So you use stats to say, okay, where are they? I'm not going to open my mechanic shop away from them, I'm gonna to try to get it where they are. So that's part of your marketing plan. But this is 99.9% .9 for you as a business owner. Me as a financer, I look and go, they got a marketing plan, yeah. done, move on to the next page, <laughs> right? And, and you know, I think it's really important for, for, for your business to have a really robust marketing plan. And also that really ties close to your product or your service providing. Um, so, so with, if it's a startup, I don't know if anybody here has used a lean canvas before. So basically, is it's it's a business plan that jammed into this one piece of uh, paper. So on, on the lean canvas, uh, it actually states, you know, what is the problem and what is your solution that addresses the problem. What is your unique uh, value proposition of, of the business and what are your customer segments? What are your revenue streams? What are your cost structures? And this living canvas should be changing, right? And it's, it's, it doesn't stay forever, but in order for you, for your business to have a really good understanding of your target market, this is what you should have. And your unique value proposition of your business and also the unfair competitive advantage of your business is gonna be the key to the success. This is also gonna be a piece that you're gonna come back to, right? So if I said I'm gonna you know, sell my widget for a dollar, here's my you know, strategy and all of that stuff, 18 months down the road, it's just not working. Go back to your marketing plan and say, okay, am I doing what I said I was gonna do in the first place? Nope, I completely deviated from that. Or did I follow this marketing plan to a T and it knocked out of the park? Did I follow my marketing plan and it completely failed? So let's revamp, it's a living document. Just because it says it doesn't mean you should say it. <coughs> Operations includes the stage of development as well as production process. Now, um, uh, so it's th this may apply to whether you are you know, um, having a service or having a product, um, but uh, you know, uh, there are a couple of stages into developing in your product. So I, I know more about the product side because that was you know, what I was doing before. Um, there are many tools to help you to develop your product. Uh, you can you know, Google these tools such as, such as a product Roadmap, right? A rate lock. So these tools help you to stay on your target. Um, for example, if you are building a, a platform or a software, there are a couple of steps that you know you are going to take, and not all of those steps or not all of those priorities should be what you should be considering now. And the pro and the stage of the development of your product should relate to your target or to to your lean camps. Is so basically, you know, what is your customers desiring? What are they? You know, what are they? their immediate need, what are they, you know, the most pain points that they have. And that's what, sh what you should be focusing on if your company is startup, and then those are the key priorities in the stages of development. In, and for you to, in order for, for you to track them, is also important, right? Because um, it, you will get lost 
if you don't have a proper place to track which stage of your company is at and what is your next priority. Uh, there are a couple of tools online that can help you. Um, Raylock, for example, and the one I like to use the most is called Trello. Uh, it's free and, and basically you can add additional people on it and everybody can view uh, what, what are some of the priorities and which what the business has been doing, what's the next step, and what has been done. So that's uh, so there are a lot of free tools for you guys to leverage. Trello? Trello. So uh, T-R-E-L-L. -L. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, production process, if you are uh, providing um, a product, so, so now you, you, you are gonna, uh, you're gonna you know, ask who are your manufacturers, right? So how, how you're gonna get your product from overseas uh, to, to, to Canada or to where your business at, or you know, are you ordering from local? So all of that is really important as well. So uh, you, you need to figure out from the point when, uh, when starting the product, to the end, so the entire cycle uh, is it, it's going to be key for for business. Mm -hmm. The section that's near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. When you give me your business plan, I'm going to read over your computer stuff right then and go bloop, right to the financial part. So this is the part that banks um, love and that we want to see. So. Three main statements that you're going to have in there, um, your cash flow statement, your income statement, and your balance sheet. Does everybody actually understand what those are? Yeah. yeah. Like, you're all business yeah. students. You all know this. No. <laughs> oh, no. Paper. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let me just. Okay, we're going to. So, <laughs> um, so basically, and especially when you're doing a startup, these statements are really super confusing. When you're an existing business, it's really great. So. I'll explain the statements in an existing business and I'll show you how they're different in a startup. So um, your income statement says that for the last 12 months, here's what we've done. And then at the bottom of that is your balance sheet, right? So it's all of that specific date, right? So it shows you your year and then it says on this date, here's the income that we had, here's the, the assets, the liabilities, everything, but it's at this back date. Your cash flow shows that month by month, right? Whereas the income statement is just a summary of the last 12 months. Does that make sense? So cash flow is your month to month, and then your income statement is that snapshot at the very end. So when you're a brand new startup business and you don't actually have financials and you're doing projections, what we're asking for is pretend like your business is open for the next 12 months. What does that look like? So your cash flow statement is where you start. And you say, okay, where do I think in what month, you know, you're not gonna start at full capacity if you're opening up a daycare. You're not gonna sell, you know, a thousand burgers your very first day you open up that door. So you have to see month by month. Or are you a cyclical business? Are you starting a landscaping business? You're not gonna be really busy in November, December, January, and February. So. It shows you that month to month. Then you say, okay, based on these projections, at the very end, here's my income statement. And normally, the balance sheet follows there. But no, we don't care what that looks like. We want a balance sheet at the beginning. So you see the disconnect here. And this is where a lot of people have a hard time putting together a balance sheet, which is all of your assets and your liabilities and your owner's equity and all of that stuff in there on a business that one doesn't <coughs> exist and two, is 12 months ahead of everything else you're telling me. Okay? So this is where that really great team, remember I told you before we're gonna get a really great lawyer, we're gonna get a really great accountant. That really great accountant is gonna help you put together those numbers. That really great accountant is gonna say, okay, here's projections. You're gonna go and you're gonna look at industry averages. You're gonna say, you know, based on a daycare or based on this business that I'm looking to start, what are the industry averages? What does the revenue look like? Again, I can write you an awesome business plan and tell you that my mechanic shop that I'm opening up, oh, I'm gonna make $10 million the first year. Is that rational? Is that reasonable? No, not at all. So then I can look at industry averages and I say, you know what? A normal mechanic shop makes about $100,000 the first year. So then let's base my projections on that. Make them rational, make them reasonable, okay? We talk about being a little conservative sometimes in your income statements. There's too conservative, and then there's, I'm making 10 million bucks this year, okay? So it's just finding that little balance. 
And the funniest thing is I think all five of us that are in this room that see business plans on a regular basis, even if they were to go and take it to an accountant and professionals work on it, they're gonna get something wrong almost 90% of the time. The balance sheet's probably gonna be wrong, probably gonna have to adjust a little things. That's that living document. Just because you put it down on paper doesn't make it the word. Trust me, I've said to a couple clients, actually one just yesterday, thank you so much for doing this. This is completely wrong. Let me assist you in what I think it should look like, but I can't touch it, right? So go back and try again. And then they'll send it to me and I'm like, try again. <laughs> it's a living document and we will work through it though. We won't write it for you, but we'll sure help you find the right places. Yeah, and uh, you know, we actually get to see financial statements every day, and generally, when we are see, seeing these financial statements, that means the business have an ask, right? So they are coming to the bank, they are coming to the lender, uh, they have a specific ask in mind. For example, you know, they may want to take out another you know, fifty thousand dollar loan if a startup, uh, they, they may need you know borrowing from the bank to inject into the, their, their business, or in, whether that's a you know leasehold improvements or equipment purchase, um, or you know or whatnot. So, uh, you know, within those financial statements, we really focus on three key points. So we analyze it. So we look at the liquidity of your business. Um, if it's a startup, we will, we will use that based on your current, uh, the opening date balance sheet. We'll look at your debt to potential network, right? How, how much leverage you have in the business. And the last thing, which is really important, we will look at the, the ability to service uh, the additional debt that you're about to take on. Right, and, and then if your your business is startup, we are gonna use your projections, and that's what Carrie mentioned. Does your projections make sense? So the projections is really important for a startup, and that's what's gonna be measured against whether if your business is able to take on the steps that you're gonna ask. Risk and conclusions. So. I think this one is really important to the lender because uh, you know we always assess your business plan, your business, your financial statements uh, at two levels, right? So we, we want to prepare for the worst case possible. So you know we always ask ourselves, uh, when the business fails, uh, does the business have enough uh, cash flow to cover the debt that we're going to provide to you? Uh, and also, you know. Just from a business business owner standpoint of view, uh, you, you need to consider what are some of the both internal and external risks of your business. Um, I, uh, I find that a lot of the business fail is because a lot of the internal risks they're facing is, you know, and a lot of them have to do uh, with the management not, not able to work together, right? So do you have a good relationship with all your co-founders, with all the key members on your team? Do you have a healthy hiring pipe pipeline? And also, you know, what are some of the external risks, right? Do you have the right target market? Do you have the right product market fit? So those are, are, are the things that you really want to consider on your business plan. Uh, and also, uh, at, the, uh, at the very last, you want to write a conclusion that is concise, clear, and leaves a positive impression, whether that's to the lender, to the investor, or whoever you're presenting it to. Because uh, we will take our time to look at your business plan, we will analyze it, and if there's a good conclusion on it, uh, that just leaves a good, good patient in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the be honest about your risks and taking them seriously. Um, We'll find the holes. Here's the thing, if you if you go to the doctor uh, for a checkup and the doctor says, how's everything going? And you went, oh, I'm fine. But actually your arm is in like excruciating pain all the time. The doctor doesn't know that. But you know what, the doctor's gonna like do some tests. He's gonna figure it out eventually. So don't you think it's better if you go into that and say, I'm doing great, except for the fact that my arm really hurts. So then it helps that doctor hone in on that and address that fact and mitigate it, make it better, right? So coming into a bank, and we see it all the time, they have this blemish and they try to just like hide it or they try to say it's not there. But it would be way better if they said, absolutely, by the way, I missed a whole bunch of credit card payments three years ago. So I have, you know, collections on my credit bureau, but this is why it happened and this is what I've done to rectify it. Don't make us find the hole. Tell us about the hole, how you fixed it, and then we can actually, like it's, it's, we can make a bridge across it and we can help with that. 
okay? Super important that you try not to cover things up because it'll come back and those are the things that are gonna bite you. Those are the things that are gonna provide risks to your business that are gonna make you <coughs> money in, or that are gonna give us the reason to decline you, okay? Um, so, as, as mentioned before, your business plan, your lean canvas, uh, it's always a living document. But when you draft it up, when you're presenting to, to, to the bank, uh, to the investor, so that is only a snapshot in time. Uh, but you know, for, for your business, as business owners, you should be always revisiting your business plan. Because you know, think, things might be changing, the market might, might be changing, or even your, your business, right? Your product strategy might, might be changing. So you are allowed to pivot. Right, so you, uh, if you find there is a bigger opportunity in the market, you are going to make those adjustments on the business plan. Yeah. One fun thing I've done with some of my startup clients is I've actually I keep a copy of their business plan, and then when they come back a year later with their actual financial, I go, "How did we do?" And nine times out of ten, the business owners go, "Whoa!" And I'm like, "But you put all this time and effort into this beautiful business plan. Go back to it." Let's look at your actual financials to your actual projections. How did we do? Is it working? Is it not working? It's fun. It's a neat little thing to do. So hopefully a your accountant is talking to you about that stuff as well. So that yeah, use it. You put all this time and effort into it. Don't just let it sit there and collect dust. Yeah. And you know, what, what, that actually just reminds me, um, at the same time, you, you shouldn't be really nostalgic about your business plan, right? Because it's, it's all, always changing. Um, just give you an example of how Uber started. So they actually first started by buying out a lot of the luxury Mercedes V vehicle. And that was back in San Francisco, I, I, I forgot the year. Uh, and you know, the reason why they did that is that they feel the taxi companies uh, it's just not enough cabs around. So, so, so they actually started out as a cab, cab company that offers luxury service to to the people who wants to get from point A to point B, right? And they actually didn't stick onto their business plan. They quickly pivoted because as they need to be able to scale in in a in a faster pace, uh, they want to acquire more more of the market. They found found themselves they couldn't compete <coughs> with the traditional cap companies, right? Because they are they were a startup. Uh, and one of the you know nicest things about their pivot was they were to able to outsource a lot of the cab drivers mm -hmm. to you know what we are having today. So uh, your business plan is is not something that's fixed. Uh, you know it can be adjusted uh, as to you know what the market wants from the business. So yeah, that completely leads into this slide that. No one can predict the future. So you can put all this work into your business plan and think, okay, I got the right location, I got the right business, I got the right timing, I got the right everything. Open up your business. Whoops. Something, something else went wrong. So it's, again, is your business scalable? These are all the things that you kind of have to think about, right? But, yeah. yeah. Uncertain times. Things can change on a dime. We all know that. We've seen the economy lately. All it takes is one contract, right? To either go through or to be declined. And it changes the whole economy. With that, um, we'll be happy to take questions. Uh, the little starting a business, that's, uh, this guidebook is right here. Um, so, and that's just, you can go and like download your own copy. We didn't want to kill hundreds of trees today. So we just printed out the one. This is really great because it goes through everything that we just talked about. So it goes through, uh, but a little bit more about like how do you actually start a business? Where do you go from here? <coughs> uh, and then, uh, like I said, we have sample business plans on our website as well, um, as well as uh, the, just the little plug and play template that we have to start your business plan. So again, it doesn't have to be fancy. It can be fancy. I like fancy. Doesn't change my financial doesn't change my financial position at all. You know, it doesn't make me uh, want to lend to a company anymore. But it is what it is. So that would have templates for all of your financial statements and everything yep. there as well. Yep. Okay. 
Yeah, and again, I'm just gonna plug the RBC stuff. Why? Because they pay me to. Um, but there's you believe in it. I, oh yeah, I believe in it. That's the part I was looking for. Thank you. Let my manager know I said that. Um, but there's hundreds of other templates out there. I'm sure you could go to other places and, and get those as well. I just know what ours look like and how how good ours is. We put a lot of uh, a lot of work into these things. And, and I, I think, to be honest, creating your own business plan should be a fun uh, process, right? By understanding, you know, truly understanding the core of your business, by understanding who are your customers, uh, you know, and sometimes that means for you to go out on the streets asking questions to to random people, right? Conduct the right interviews, ask the right questions, and to find out if your service or product is addressing their pain points. If it is, then you know there there is a market validation for you, right? So, and and I think that's that's part of creating your business plan, is how well you understand your own business. Yeah. I also um, was speaking to someone in the other one, and they said, well, you know, if I put all this time and energy into a business plan, I bring it to a bank, you know, what's the worst that's gonna happen? And I said, we're gonna tell you, absolutely this is viable, hey, let's go forward with this, or we're gonna say, not right now, not at this time, Here's where the holes are. Here's what we can do to help. So I don't, I don't like saying the word no. I like to say not right now, which is a completely different story, right? So don't be scared to sit down with a banker and say, is this viable? Is this rational? Is this reasonable? Most of us don't bite. Most of us won't laugh in your face. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> just when you're gone. But just, yeah, exa- I wait until you leave, all of those fun things. But this is what we do. We see this on a regular basis. I don't like not helping. So if I can say, your business is great except for these pieces, go work on those pieces and come back. My greatest achievement is seeing someone that I said, not right now to, come back, and then we do it and we succeed, right? I also have some of my greatest failures that I've ever seen is when a client is coming and giving me a business plan and I've said, not right now, these are your holes and these are your gaps. And they've just gone out and completely ignored it and done it anyways. Mm -hmm. I don't take great pride in walking past that business that opened up for six months because he didn't listen. We're here for advice. We really are. So, so our recommendation for you guys is ask. Yeah, right? absolutely. Just ask questions and ask for help. Uh, I think there's a lot of misconceptions that you know uh, when they ask for help, they are not not going to get it or whatever, or they may be afraid of you know like asking uh, that you know by exposing themselves uh, you know or whatnot. But uh, you know if you, you if you go out there, if you ask us, if you ask other people, I think a lot of people, they are willing to provide that help mm-hmm. to you, to a business. So now do we have any questions? <laughs> 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 yeah. um, so you were talking about a specific um, sector like nails, for instance, if there's too many in the strip mall or yeah. something. Is that where Stats Canada would help you to see what's the, the geographic um, saturation in a particular sector? Yes. Yeah. 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 Have you played around in the South Canada? No, I've never yeah. Okay. Oh, gosh. You can, you can drill down for lots of things. Population. Like if you, again, if you're marketing your product to men, you're not going to go, and you can actually look in neighborhoods in the city of Edmonton. Um, some of the smaller outlying communities aren't going to have all of that information. Um, but yeah, you can find, oh look, this you know neighborhood here has 80% of the population is men. That's why, and it's really funny because uh, that's why the city of Edmonton does the census. That's why we do all of this stuff is so that we have the data so that people can use it. And I think it's actually pretty underutilized yeah. in terms of it. Um, it's not just Stats Canada though. There is, like RBC ourselves, we are the number one the largest corporation that has the most amount of data. You gotta think, how many clients do we have? We've been around for so long. We collect this data and we use it, right? 
Uh, we don't sell it to third parties, we use it for ourselves. But there's other places around there that can say, like so Vertical IQ is one of those, um, those, those sites that uses that type of data to make those, those um, inferences and just say, you know what, we think this is a really great location for you. And does that also, um, on the Stats Canada, will it also show you how many business failures there are in that particular niche or sector? Like how many opened and didn't make it in 12 months? Or? Um, I, I don't think it shows that. So. Um, as far as, so I, I actually used it before, so uh, I don't know in for nail or, you know, uh, that I just that but just, yeah, and your failures or your success rate. But, but they, they actually tell you, you know, where are the locations, uh, you know, of the, of the business. active e exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think vertical IQ might, might be able to help with that question. So vertical IQ will tell you, you know, what are some of the industry benchmarks, you know, uh, what are the percentage of the business that are profitable, things like that. Yeah, that's the, the data metrics and the benchmarks and yeah. things like that. Uh, the other thing is actually going into a bank and talking to a banker and to say, uh, hey, Catlin, I'm looking to open up a restaurant. What's the bank's risk appetite on this? Um, we're going to tell you based on based on our data, we're going to say, absolutely, we want restaurants, but you have to put a boatload of your money in before we'll give you a little bit of ours. Why? Because that's that risk versus return, right? So, yeah, we're going to be able to tell you a little bit what industries are great and what industries are not great. Healthy eating, amazingly enough, not doing very well at all. And do you have a threshold percentage of what you would find on a startup? Like, yeah. based on balance sheet, 20%, 30%, like, what's, okay, what's so a normal funding ratio between, you know, owner or investor versus the bank? So I want it, my little benchmarky type things. If you're going to come in and say, okay, I want, this project is going to cost $300,000. I want my clients coming in with about 50% of their own cash. Whether we use it or not is another story, right? So then we have other programs. So most institutions, uh, when we're just lending straight across for a desk, we ask you to put 25% in, and then we'll lend you 75% out. We have government programs that we can use uh, called the Canadian Small Business Financing Loan. Any financial institution has access to this. It's not just RBC specific. Uh, but they say, you know, we'll give you a guarantee. So now the person can put 10% down on the desk We'll finance 90%, but when that business fails, the government's going to give us some of our money back, so we're more apt to give that out. Okay, and that's for expansion and startups. So again, I like to see a client come in with at least 50% of the total project cost in available funds, and then what we, because the one thing we don't want to do is make you cash poor, ever. So we don't want to say, okay, use all your cash, and then we'll just give you a little bit, because when the unexpected happens. What are you going to fall back on? How are you going to pay your rent when you've only had six kids into your daycare when you thought you'd have 10? So if we can use more of our money, less of yours, it leaves that money buffer to fund that shortage later on. We always say cash is king, right? So we always look at the cash flow of the business. And historically, that is the number one um, issue that will make a small business fail is going in undercapitalized because you are depending far too much on debt and you don't have that wiggle room for when things go wrong. Yeah. Um, what about um, websites like Owner to help get things started? Getting oh. registered? Yeah, Owner is going to help you register your company. There, um, RBC has our RBC Ventures page. There's all sorts of free apps. They're for clients and non-clients. Um, one is Owner, O-W-N-R. Spelling isn't our best thing. <laughs> and through that, you can very economically register business. Um, <coughs> you've got a very simple ownership structure. If you're, if you're getting to be a more complex owner structure and you've got some investors, that sort of thing, absolutely go to your lawyer. But if it's just gonna be you or some other family member or whatever, owner is great. Yeah, I'm, I'm more, dead. my if it's you and your spouse, yeah. like somebody that you're gonna sleep in a bed together yes. with. Forever. That, forever. Yes, that is, like if it's just you or just your spouse, I think, 
things like owner or just going down to corporate registries and just registering it is great. It's when you get into those slightly more complex situations, when I'm going into a partnership, you know, with, with Eric here. So you need to see a lawyer. Again, it's that other piece. Why? Because there's so much more behind it that you need to speak with them about that they'll tell you about the risks and why you shouldn't, you know, putting in different partnership structures and making sure the shares, because something happens to me, Eric didn't go into business with my husband. He went into business with me, right? So partnership agreements. Uh, and lawyers are going to do all of that stuff. That's why you need a really good one to say, here's your risks, right? If it's just me starting up my own business, I'm not a risk to my, well, no, I am a risk to myself some days, but that's just normally Saturday nights and Sunday mornings. Um, or Friday night. Or Friday night sometimes, yes. Um, so again, those are all those things. So when you're looking at starting up a business and you're looking, what is your share structure going to be? What is, are you going to do sole proprietorship? You know, all of those things, all of those pieces, that's what you really need to look for. And that's why that team is important and you go through it all. And repeat every single year. Don't forget to file your annual fees either. Yeah. Any other questions? Great. So we will be sticking around for a little bit. Uh, if you if you want to ask us individually, uh, we're happy to take, take your questions. And I will also encourage you to talk to our colleagues back there, uh, especially with Deborah Cerny. She is the senior commercial account manager that specialized in technology sector. So uh, she is a vast of you know, knowledge that uh, <laughs> and, yeah. and Eric actually looks after our um, smaller markets technology sector. So yeah, so um, with that, um, thank you very much yeah. for, uh, for coming to our session. And uh, we, can, we can chat. Uh, Okay, can you guys join me in thanking all of you for coming to the Innovation Challenge? We're giving away three thousand dollars in March, so you don't want to miss that. Um, if you're going to chat one on one, I'm going to ask you to use the two rooms so I can get this set up because there's a meeting after this. But there, oh no, just use C and the hallway here. And don't forget to give us your feedback. Thank you.
I'm yeah. from the Philippines. Yeah. yeah. I love I love your food, when it's, especially when it's spicy. Uh-huh. It's not that spicy, like the biting in your mouth. Like I did not yeah, do this. So it's like, are, are you? Have you no, I have. Or are you sorry. Sorry. I've eaten some because my mom yeah. used to work yeah. on the weekends. She's a pretty dog. She's a like, uh, like one of the board of directors in the UK. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like child care.